Oh, uh, good morning, everyone. So my name's Joe, as you know. Um, I'm on the board of CIFA, uh, uh, and also uh, I'm on the advisory panel looking at the code of conduct. Um, I also assist CIFA with professional conduct matters, uh, and that caused me to look at the current code of conduct a lot. Um, so I, I, I've got to know it, which has it was very, been very helpful, sort of preparing for today, really. So Pete asked me to um, think about the meaning of the term contract in terms of of the code of conduct and the relationship between CIFA as a professional body and uh, the public. So uh, I, I thought the metaphor of uh, different objects being brought being drawn together was useful uh, thinking about this and thinking about what we're trying to do. So we're considering the meaning of, uh, of a contract between this a professional group um, and, and the public and, and what that might, how we might achieve that, how we might so um, the, the body corporate is a, a term that's used um, in some of the official papers of, of CIFA. Uh, and, and I've got a little clip put on, on the screen there. I suppose I think it's a useful way of, of uh, thinking about it because we, all of us, all of us members are the body corporate. Um, CIFA is its membership. So CIF is an entity, not a person, but all, but it is made of people. I think that it's it's worth kind of rehearsing that in, in one's mind, thinking about this topic. So in the in the context of this talk, we, we absolutely mean the membership. So CIF may be one of several organisations that we're involved with uh, in our lives or work, uh, but that connection can feel very close on a day like today when, when we're immersed in it and surrounded by people who are part of it. Um, in, in terms of the body corporate, there's a constancy. So even when we're not perhaps as aware as we are today, the agreements we've made um, through agreeing to the code of conduct, for example, are a constant thing. And I think it's, uh, that's worth bearing in mind as we, as we think about, again, what we're trying to achieve with it. With the revisions we may be doing, this piece of text is um, on the CIFA website. It's kind of one of the, the first things that, that greets you as, you as you land, as it were. Um, the, the, the bold words I, I've put on uh, are ones that I thought were, were relevant and, and I, I, they take a central place even in this kind of summary text. So professional standards, ethics, recognition, respect and profession so I think the, the code of conduct, in terms of what it may achieve at its best, is to convey messages to the public, you know, of which our clients are a part, but the wider public as well, that we want recognition and respect and we want to be seen as professional. And we're going to do that partly through having professional standards and demonstrable ethics, ethical code. So in terms of the public, these bullet points are some of the things that we might hold out uh, often as, as benefits. Um, knowledge gained via investigation, knowledge held in archives, opportunities to take part, opportunities to experience archaeology in the past. These are the things that are often cited as, as benefits to the public. And it's important to note that every professional archaeologist uh, accredited by CIFA and every CIFA registered organisation has, has, in agreeing to the Code of Conduct, acknowledged their duty to act in the public interest. The meanings of the Code of Conduct, I, I jotted these down from discussions that uh, have been party to in terms of the advisory group. Um, so the Code of Conduct is a contract between each member to each member. It's a promise of how we will behave as professional archaeologists responsible for enhancing and protecting the reputation of each other and our institute. And through the Code of Conduct, individual CIFA members agree to deliver what CIFA does. And those may seem obvious on some level, but I think um, the Code of Conduct, when I most often encounter it, is a, a set of rules or, or principles. And uh, it, it does well, so I think, to remind ourselves what the underlying meaning is and the, and, and the purpose. Um, so this is a, a summary list, a, a succinct list of, of the current code of conduct in terms of the principles. It's uh, very 
succinct, obviously, and in, and in being so succinct, you, you're losing a lot of the nuance uh, and the explanation. I, I realise that. I find it quite useful because it helps to steer me when I'm trying to consider where a certain issue might lie or where it might lie in several of these. Um, wh whether a revised code of conduct should be wider than that uh, or more narrow in its scope is uh, one of the topics that we might be considering today. I think it, it, as you look down that list, um, the, it's, it's, it seems to me a lot of it's about what we do, what we're doing literally technically. Um, there are other areas, principle one and principle five are, uh, are issues around how we do those technical things. But uh, you know, the order and, and, and the breadth of that list may change as part of this process. Um, th this is uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's a pyramid that appears all over the place. It's often referred to when people are considering how to motivate people or why people might do something or not do something in a certain situation. I, I thought of it in terms of the code of conduct as a, as just as a way of explaining where it might sit. Um, you know, if we were to consider uh, the environment as a, an archaeological site, um, behaviours as how we investigate and record, skills being the methodology, the manuals we maybe use. The code of conduct seems to come in at the values level uh, above those. And our identity in this instance, uh, it's very specific, it's as members of CIFA. We, we all have many other identities, I'm sure, but you know, in the context of this. And, and so I, I just highlight it because I think it's w worth considering where it sits and where most of our work is done, which is b below that level. Um, the, 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 the sort of theory behind the triangle is that change is made higher up the level at the sort of identity values level. If we do persuade ourselves to shift in, in those areas, then, then the parts below become much simpler and easier. So you know, if we align ourselves with the values and identity um, of a certain organization or a certain code, then the skills we need, the behaviors we should have, and the way we act in a certain environment will become more, more obvious and, and more straightforward to do. Pete asked me to pose a few questions to help uh, go into the next part of this. And, and so build, building on that point, I thought it w was helpful asking myself really at uh, what level we, we're agreeing to a code of conduct and can we shift the level up? When I joined CIFA, it was um, uh, as a sort of entry level employee really, looking for um, excavation sort of jobs at the time. And uh, it was very much an environment level decision. You know, I thought that by joining, I might uh, increase my chances of, of getting employment or being retained. I thought it might convince employers that I, I was worth, uh, you know, giving a, giving a chance to. Um, I, I signed up to the code of conduct, but that wouldn't have been uppermost in my thoughts at the time. I think I would have seen that as a, something I must do because I'm joining, but rather than really buying into it at a, at a higher level. So I think I signed up to it at the environment level. I, I don't know if uh, that's, that's common or not, but it, it, you know, it, might, it might be wider. Um, I, I point it out because I think if, if we were to have a code of conduct that was um, accessible enough and intuitive enough at the values level and that people felt able to sign up to at that level, um, it might be more powerful um, ra rather than signing up because we need a ticket or a certificate there's nothing specifically wrong with that, but it might have more influence and it might have more effect and people might be more inclined to um, take on its values quicker if, if, if it was more accessible at the values level. It's, it's, it's a thought. Um, anxiety or status, which does the code of conduct evoke in members? I suppose it depends how you're encountering it. I mean, sometimes people can... Um, feel it's a struggle to remember which principle or which specific rule they need to be considering at a certain time. They might be doing the right thing generally. They might find it tricky to remember which principle that relates to. Um, it's quite a long document at the moment. So there can be just the anxiety around remembering it all. Uh, there might be anxiety because we think we've maybe strayed off course from it. And maybe that, some of that anxiety is always going to be there and maybe it's legitimate. 
I, I, I raised the point of status because it, it, it wider than CIFA, if, if you look at the way code of conducts are used in different places, they're often used to convey status and they're not, not necessarily um, designed to induce anxiety. They're more about getting people to sign up and be proud uh, that they're a member of something and that they've signed up to a certain code of ethics. Obviously, there's something going on where the, that organisation is demonstrating to the public that it has ethics and that it has high standards. But the point is for the people inside, they're signing up to it because they want the status associated with it. And I wonder whether with the Code of Conduct at CIFA it is seen in that way or whether it would be helpful if it was more often seen in that way. Um, what kind of language should be used? So really here I'm thinking not so much about the meaning of what's being said, the, 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 the intention of the rules, but more what sort of language to understand. Pete, Pete uh, hinted at this earlier as, as he finished his presentation. I mean, you know, is it accessible at the moment? Does it look a bit too legal? Is it too long? Could it be simpler? Could it be better? Um, the format, again, should it be rejigged, renumbered? Does that help? Um, I suppose what I'm saying is that it's not all about the meaning of the rules or necessarily changing the rules. It might be about making them m more intuitive and more accessible. Um, ceremonial ritual. I, I, at the moment, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a document that sits mainly digitally, I, I imagine. I think um, lots of people probably sign it digitally. Um, maybe on paper sometimes, but there's no movement um, involved. There's no verbal exchange, I don't think. There's no uh, presentation in front of peers. Um, lots and lots of ceremonies and rituals exist for, for these kinds of things where you're joining a group, accepting its rules, getting some status. W would that help? Because one of the things I find with the Code of Conduct is um, people are not necessarily familiar with, with its contents or necessarily familiar with when they signed up to it. There's a, there's a feeling they signed up when they joined, but what does that mean? And would it help to, if it stood out a bit more? 